Hello again. So in the last video, we looked at the seals of the Great Tribulation. Very, very soon, we're going to look at the trumpets. However, it is almost impossible to maintain that one understands the book of Revelation, one might say anything in the Bible, if your knowledge of Genesis is sorely lacking. So today we're going to have an exploration into one very particular uh, kind of creature um, that was running around in the early chapters of the Bible's first book. And that is very, very important uh, to study before we actually have an in-depth look at the trumpets. Otherwise, the trumpets will make no sense whatsoever. So today we're going to have a look at the second heavenly rebellion. The second time that heaven told the Lord to go stuff himself. Once upon a time, there was a particular noble angel. Uh, the Bible gives him different names. The most common one is the Assyrian. He decided to sleep with human women, and he created the first generation of hybrids known as the Nephilim. This guy was the demonic king over the pre-flood world, also known as the antediluvian earth. To find out about him, have a look at Ezekiel 31. Verse 2, 7, and 9 talk about how beautiful he was, how majestic and how powerful. I mean, with Satan totally and utterly given over to the darkness by this stage, this guy was probably angel number one. Ezekiel 31, verses 3, 8, and 9 actually say that this angel could even be found in the Garden of Eden. Now, it might say Lebanon, but prophetically, Lebanon is Eden. Um, you could cross-reference Isaiah 2, 12 to 13, or Psalm 29, 1 to 7. So this angel didn't fall in the first heavenly rebellion when Lucifer convinced an array of heavenly beings to side with him uh, in an attempt to um, overthrow the man that was coming. Then verses three to nine show that this angel was a leader angel, maybe even one of the archangels, maybe even a chief prince, who knows. And other angels were under him. As you read through it, you'll see lots of references to trees, but trees just represent leaders. Think of in Daniel 4, 2 to 22, the big tree is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Or when <clears throat> one of Gideon's sons um, decided to declare himself the king of Shechem, and he killed 69 of his brothers, and one escaped. The one who escaped to give a prophecy of trees regarding leaders. But because he was so strong, and so large, and so powerful, and so just full of the holiness and the glory that God had put in him. Verse 10 tells us that he grew proud. He became conceited, arrogant, haughty, thought he was better than everybody else. And verse 6 says that there were wild creatures underneath this tree. So basically, he was involved in the impregnation of human women and the birthing of wild creatures. And in the anti-Diluvian pre-flood world, there was nothing wilder or more sinister than the Nephilim. Humans and angels were never, ever supposed to sleep with each other. In fact, angels are supposed to be sexless beings. Princess Missies are supposed to be squarely with the Lord. Um, to have a crossover of two species, it would be like a human doing it with a dog. It, it's an abomination in God's eyes. We know that from Mark 12, 25, which expressly um, says that the angels in heaven are not given over in marriage. But because these ones chose to, with an act of their will, the Syrian did it first, and as the leader, people, did, well, the other angels just said, well, we'll do it too. 
Genesis 6, 1-4 says that the sons of God, angels, did the nasty with the daughters of men, human women. And as a result, the world would never be the same again. Because those angels had disobeyed, well, firstly, they lost their holiness. They became unholy. They became dark angels. They became demons. And their offspring, the Nephilim, became tyrants. It says here in Genesis 6, 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The Nephilim means a bully, a tyrant, a giant. So of incredibly tall stature, or naturally tall, or supernaturally tall, one might say. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. In Greek and Roman mythology and other cultures too, you'll hear stories of human women sleeping with divine beings and giving birth to Herculean um, demigods. This is where it all came from. The word mighty men there does not mean anything good. Okay, it's not like, oh, he's a mighty man of God, so he is. Nope, yeah, it's the opposite. It means one who magnifies himself, not a who's uplifted by the Lord. Behaves proudly, a tyrant. One who is bold, audacious, a giant, strong man, a champion, a chief. A warrior is powerful, valiant, and outstanding. The Lord did not like this. It was the absolute corruption of the human genome. And in Genesis 3, Jesus had already prophesied that he would come into the earth. That from the seed of the woman, from the sperm of the woman, women don't have sperm, so a pregnant virgin, he would come and deal with evil. He would crush the serpent's head. He would crush Satan and evil on Golgotha, Calvary, the Mount of the Skull. This was an attempt right here to actually stop a human from coming into the earth, a human who was also God, to deal with the sin issue. So not only were they acting out of lust on uh, selfish desire, but on some level, they knew that they were actually operating to stop biblical prophecy from taking place. The oldest biblical prophecy in the Bible as it pertains to our salvation. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. People say the world's bad today. You have no idea what bad looks like. And therefore, the Lord regretted what he had done, and he decided to send a flood to wash them all away. But there was one man on the earth that God chose to maintain the human population through. And in Genesis 6, 9, it says, This is the account of Noah, a righteous man, blameless among the people. Yes, he had faith and walked with his God. But blameless, the Hebrew word, means morally blameless, but also physically and biologically without blemish. Complete, full, perfect, sound, without spot, undefiled. Now let's compare that with Genesis 6, 11. Now the earth was corrupt, meaning perverse, ruined, hello, blemished, acted corruptly, sure enough, Destroyed, felled, polluted, stifled, wrecking, destruction, violated, with an emphasis on violated semen. You might think Hebrew actually has a word for that. Yeah. Spoiled, marred, decaying, wasted. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. What do you call a world where there is full of violence? A world war. So World War I did not start in 1914, people. <laughs> it may have been World War II. The original World War, or World War Zero, if you want to call it that, actually took place back here, where these Nephilim 
were so abominably wicked and destructive that all they did was try to kill each other all the time, as well as any pure blood humans. To the point where Noah and his family were the only biologically pure people left. So at this point, you have Noah, his wife, and his sons. They're pure, pure bloods, if uh, you want to use a Harry Potter reference. If some of you might think it's a bit controversial. Um, but now his sons were adults, and they did have wives. But their wives probably looked human, but probably had a strain of Nephilim DNA, which we'll come back to um, in another video later on. And that has serious ramifications after the Flood. So back to Ezekiel 31, verses 11 to 13. It refers to the Assyrian spirit being handed over to the destroyer, to the original deceiver, the OG king of darkness, to Satan, to punish, to torture, and to torment, until he was so utterly beaten and depleted. He was brought down in a humiliating, devastating, and irrevocable defeat. All the other wicked spirits mocked the Assyrian and trod on him. You know, just, you can just imagine them walking over like, he's dead, Ugh. they got a Manchester United football match. Uh, who are the Red Devils, interestingly enough. Um, why would Satan punish another rebellious spirit, you might ask? Satan delights in calamity. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and I assure you, demons do not like each other. They are not friends. <laughs> they hate each other too. They operate in fear and terror, and they are united in doing wickedness, but they don't actually love each other. So there will be times when they will take advantage of opportunities to steal someone's assignment or their crown or their position. They're not friends. The very same with the one world government um, which we looked at recently. We've got 10 kings who are working underneath the Antichrist, but, you know, the 10 kind of become seven because the three kind of get that, kind of get crapped out because <laughs> they don't like each other. It's a kingdom of clay and iron. It doesn't really mesh well. They hate Jesus. They're united in that. But they love each other. Sorry. They love themselves more than they love each other. And demons have no love. They're cut off from entirely. They do not love, they do not like, they do not forgive. There's no compassion in the kingdom of darkness. If you think it's a little bit strange still, the idea of someone being handed over to Satan for punishment, uh, even one evil person to another. Um, you can turn your attention to First Timoth First Timothy, one, eighteen to twenty, and uh, that will further substantiate what I just said. Okay, so with the great flood, the Garden of Eden was destroyed. The Lord sent a great flood for forty days and forty nights, and His thunder and His lightning lit up the sky. Psalm 29, 1-7 gives a very, very vivid description of what it looked like. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon, which again, prophetically, is Eden. He makes Lebanon, Eden, leap like a calf. Um, so basically, and we're talking about an earthquake here. Um, Syrian, which is a Sidonian name for Hermon, which you see. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, like a young wild ox, and the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. Even in heaven, like we looked at recently, there is always thunder and lightning around the throne of God. That's just how powerful he is. The description continues on towards verse 11. 
the voice of the Lord strikes with flames of fire. Okay, we're not just talking about rain here. We're talking abject destruction. Um, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Earthquakes, incredible winds. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry glory. That's his temple in heaven, not the earth. That one hadn't been built yet. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. Yep, you bet he is. The Lord gives his, well, eight people. <laughs> Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his daughters-in-law. Strength. And the Lord blesses those very, very few people with peace on the ark. Were they sitting there breaking it? No, they weren't. They were fine. They were grand. So the point of the flood was, yes, to wash away the Nephilim, yes, to deal with the wicked, evil people who had just totally and utterly, with an act of their will, chosen to be complicit in the destruction of others and of themselves. Because the Lord is the Lord of the harvest. He believed in sowing and reaping. And if you sow death, that is what you reap. If you live by the sword, that is how you die. That is a fixed law. It always has been. But it wasn't only that. He also wanted to remove the seed of the Nephilim from the earth. Now, okay, granted, he had to keep Noah's daughters-in-law alive, and they were carriers of that gene. But without having brought the flood, even Noah and his family would probably have been massacred before much longer. So when the Nephilim died, well, they went to hell because, <laughs> you know, they were, they were evil. Ezekiel 31, 16 to 18 actually says that the Nephilim, the angel-human hybrids, the wild animal, the wild creatures, were killed and they were sent down to the pit. It's the same thing. The pit, hell, Gehenna, the valley of Hinnon, Hades, Shale with its negative connotation. It's all hell. It's the same place. It's a very, very hot place, and not a place you want to go to when you're dead. But that's okay. We have the cross of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus speaks the better words. And with the cross of Jesus, you cross over from death to life. And Jesus left his grave to give you that resurrection life inside your belly. All you have to do is believe those last three to five sentences, and you are good with God. Amen. But although the Nephilim died and went to hell as created beings, um, some might say naturally, supernaturally, well, in the physical realm anyway, hell has a lower chamber, a lower realm, and it's called Tartarus, or the abyss, or the bottomless pit. We read about it a couple times. One is in First Peter, you can read 3, 17 to 22. I'm just going to read a couple of lines here. After being made alive in the spirit, that's Jesus, after his death, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of, hmm, Noah, interesting, while the ark was being built. So we're talking about a chamber here a prison world, a prison dimension, where there are demons who are disobedient in the days of Noah, and they're locked there. Very interesting. Jude 1.6 elaborates. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned an act of their will. God wasn't having a bad day. They did this to themselves. Abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So the angels who decided to have sex with human women, well, the Lord has locked them away in Tartarus, in the abyss, in the bottomless pit, in the lowest regions of hell. 
Now we're told in the word of God that the flood waters covered the earth for five months. So about 150 days, assuming most months have 30 days um, on average. Um, so the rain fell for 40 days, but we're told that the world was covered for five months. Now, Israel used the um, lunisolar calendar, so it's by, by, by five months by, by Israeli reckoning. But there's something very, very interesting, though, about the 150 days. It took 150 days for the big bad, the demonic king of the pre-flood world, the Assyrian spirit, to actually get properly taken down and locked away in Tartarus. Ezekiel 31, 15 says, In the day when the Assyrian went down to the grave, the bottomless pit, the Tartarus, the abyss, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him and restrained the floods thereof and the great waters were stayed. And Genesis 8, 3 says, And the waters were turned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Um, so effectively, it took five minutes, uh, five minutes, good one, <laughs> maybe an attorney's time. In the physical world, it took a good five months to actually drag him down into the darkness. It's the deepest pit there is. So what ultimately happened to him is in Ezekiel 31 verse 14. The Assyrian was subsequently bound in darkness in Tartarus. A dimension for demons, prison world, where they're in deepest darkness and chains that cannot be shattered. He and the good turned bad angels who had corporealized, because angels can take on physical form to help us. Well, they're supposed to be helping us. I think they more so helped to themselves in this instance. Slept at women and then got locked away from having created the hybrids. They were locked away in deepest darkness, deepest shadow, and that is where they remain to this day. And again, these are specifically the ones who rebelled in heaven's second rebellion in the days of Noah. So sexual perverts, these demons, are still in Tartarus. Second Peter 2 4 says, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into Tartarus in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. So the day of judgment, or the day more generally, isn't a literal day, it's a season, it's a seven year period, um, which we often call as theologians, the perilous times, or the great tribulation. What does that mean? It means they're locked there but they will not stay there. They will get out. Matthew 24, 37, Jesus speaks and he says, for as were the days of Noah, so will it be on the earth when the son of man comes. Now this is not talking about the rapture. The son of man is a title Jesus only ever uses regarding his judgment, regarding coming as king in glory and power to deal with evil. And again, you can compare it to the beginning of the video at Genesis 6, 1 to 5, that there are many humans on the earth. They slept with angels. They created the Nephilim. Every single thought they had was evil. They were violent. There was a world war taking place. So in the end times, in the great tribulation times, in the perilous times, you will have Nephilim on the earth again. Whether you have angels sleeping with humans or you have humans corrupting science and sorcery. Well, a lot of science is corrupt and sorcery definitely is. But putting the two together and making an incredible cesspool of sin um, you'll have a form of Nephilim running around in those days. Um, a lot of people suspect they'll be androids, um, half human, half machine, and maybe with spirit, evil spirits indwelling them, because um, especially during 
COVID with the vaccine in Scandinavia, there are even advertisements telling people, oh yeah, you know, you're gonna be superhuman if you get your your your, your vaccine chip or whatever. Um, and also in the vision of the five empires, the feet, the toes are made of clay, human, and iron machine. Now, I was in the Vatican a few years ago. Some people might think, you're Christian, you can't go there. I love history, okay? I had to go there. I was in Rome. But while I was in a room called the Room of the Prophets, where there were paintings of Elijah and the likes up on the, the ceiling and on the walls, there's a freaky deaky one here called the Cumaean Sibyl. A Cumaean Sibyl is a false prophetess, possibly prophet. Uh, it's actually a transgender. If you look at the pictures, it is very, very hard to tell if that is a male or a female, which is intentional. Um, and some of the paintings make it look like this man, woman, she male has five fingers. In some cases, it looks like there are six fingers on each hand. So basically, it's supposed to be a transgender or an ethylene, effectively. Now, the Chimean Sibyl, I think most people recognize it actually was a woman, um, but uh, be a woman who wanted to be perceived as a man. And the Chimean Sibyl, um, though the Vatican recognized her as um, a legitimate prophet who deserves to be on the same level as the prophets of God, uh, she was very definitely under the influence of a serpent spirit, a python spirit. Um, so that's to say that the prophecies are not something you're supposed to agree with. Um, but if you come into agreement with them, well, it's probably going to be for your own destruction. But uh, they were not Holy Spirit given, we'll just say that. But here are some interesting things that that brutish looking lady came out with. Now, the last age by Cumae's Sybil song has come and gone. And the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign, and a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou, at the boy's birth, in whom the iron shall cease, the golden race arise, befriend him chaste, Lucino, his thine own Apollo reigns. So effectively, what this wicked prophet, uh, or false prophet, whatever you want to call her, is saying is in the end there will be a new breed of creatures that will come down from the sky and uh, so I think it's very interesting that a lot of the world's governments right now are perpetuating the alien myth aliens exist they're called demons <laughs> but you know oh mexico are like oh well we found the corpse of one and the u.s democrats who just or well rats as i like to call them um, they're like, oh no, it's not, they're absolutely legit, they're 100% true, oh yes, we've never doubted this for a second, and you've got NASA flying space shuttles with demonic names and images and all this crack, um, Madonna leading a tour for, uh, a few years back, and the Pope following her everywhere she went, um, where she was talking about, you know, a new race of creature on the earth, and then you have, uh, besides um on mount rushmore or just next to it to have lucifer the infrared on the big telescope looking for aliens so the fix is in the governments of the earth know exactly what they want their cover story to be when the rapture happens they want to make it seem like there's been an alien abduction okay and that's where they got the idea but this sybil says that not only will you have alien type creatures running around the earth the new men but also Apollo will reign. Very, very interesting. Apollo actually does appear in the Bible. Apollo is the Assyrian spirit. And as you see, when we look at the trumpets in the next video, the Bible refers to Apollo, this godlike being trapped in the bowels of the earth in the lowermost chamber of Tartarus. The Bible calls the Assyrian or Apollo, Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer.